Welcome again to another Friday night, and we continue to work on a new series. This is the sixth week on healthy supports. In the last five weeks, we've been looking at what makes a healthy person. What are, what are safe people? What do they look like? And we've come at it from the perspective of red flags. This week and next, I want to shift to what does a healthy support group look like? What's a healthy surrogate family look like? And tonight I want to give you a perspective on unhealthy families that I've mentioned in passing but never really taught in detail. And I hope you'll find it very helpful. And it's related to how involved are family members with each other. And so there's a a simple quadrant that is used and so on the top you have enmeshed families and on the bottom you have disengaged families. And so you can have rigidly enmeshed, chaotically enmeshed, rigidly disengaged, and chaotically disengaged. All of those types of families produce complex trauma. And what we're going to see is some are very subtle, um, others are very obvious. So I want to start with the disengaged, since that's what many of you will relate to quite quickly. So the rigidly disengaged family, and some would describe this family as a, like a military boot camp, um, where there's the, the authority who gives out the rules and forces them, and so the rules are clear, and everybody just feels like a boot camp, but nobody feels connected in the family. And one way to look at this and understand it is <clears throat> the priority in the parent's mind is to get the children to obey. The priority is not about let's meet their needs, let's make sure that they're understood. Obedience becomes more important than that. And so what is important to understand is there's healthy ways to get obedience, but there's unhealthy ways. And what this family does is gets it out of balance and has unhealthy ways of getting obedience. And the emphasis is on discipline. It's not on nurturing the child, understanding the child, connecting to the child. It's all about the children need to know the rules and that I'm the boss and what I think, and they need to learn to obey. And that is a rigidly disengaged family. And so for a lot of children growing up in that family, they just can't wait to leave home and get away from all of the rules. And many of them, because they feel no connection inside the family, it's rather cold, they look for connection outside and get involved in their peer groups, and that peer pressure becomes a big thing for them. The second is the chaotic, chaotically disengaged family. And this is a family that's basically defined by the address. There's no structure. There's no connection. Home is just where you eat and sleep. You don't really connect with anybody there. It's just like a hotel where you pop in and, and eat and sleep and then basically live an individual life outside of that. And so this style of family, some have referred to it as People are isolated islands within the family system. The family might have some special times together, but they are very rare. It is not something that is common at all. So those are the disengaged types of families, and many of you grew up in that. The challenges that you will have in recovery is learning how to connect in healthy ways, since you've never really connected. So attachment. You also may struggle with ODD, oppositional defiance disorder. You're so sick of that military leader, mom or dad, that anybody that kind of acts like they're the boss and they're giving out rules, you just react to and want to dig in your heels and rebel. You also might have some false guilt because of all the different rules, some of which made sense, some of which didn't, but you still feel guilty if you broke the rules, that even the ones that didn't make sense. And so you carry a lot of false guilt. Secondly, because everybody's, disenga or next, because everybody's disengaged, you often don't know what a healthy bubble looks like because you've never had anybody in your bubble. 
And so now it's going to be important for you to learn healthy boundaries, healthy what it is to let people in, how close to let them in, or to let them in at all. And so there's, those are going to be some of the challenges that you face as you grow in your life. Now I want to come to the enmesh families. And I want to spend the rest of the time here because I think it's an important one to understand. So rigidly enmeshed. This is a family that appears to be very close. They do everything together. In fact, they <coughs> do so much together that people can even finish each other's sentences. That's how well they seem to know each other. And this type of family often uses their closeness because they do everything together as a point of pride. And they look down on families that don't do everything together. The key is this. They may appear to be close, but they're not really. And we'll explain that in a little bit. The next thing is there's a lot of control by the leader. A lot of that is not spoken control. It is just subtle, and the children sense it. And so as a result of that, people in the family, the children, often feel smothered often feel they can't do anything on their own and somebody <coughs> excuse me somebody's always watching over them and so there's a controlled environment feeling and then they begin as they back away to realize everybody plays a role in this family everything has its place and so they, they realize, wow, there is a lot of control, even though it's not overt, it's just felt. And then if they try to break away from this family, it is very difficult. And they will be seen as being disloyal, they will be seen as being against their family, and they will get usually a lot of opposition. So that is the third one. Fourth one is the chaotically enmeshed. And this one is just, there's an emotional connection within some of the family members, but there's not a bunch of order or organization within the family system. And so two things can happen. The kids kind of raise themselves because there's so much chaos, or the kids raise each other. And so that's where the connection is. Outside of that, there's not organization, and so what's going to happen tomorrow? Who knows? Anybody's guess? Because there doesn't seem to be clear leadership within this family. So those are the four. Now, I want to take this enmeshment further and really break it down for you because though it's easy to explain enmeshment in one sense, it's actually very difficult because... Most enmeshed families don't see themselves as unhealthy. In fact, they think that they're very healthy. And they think their over-involvement with each other is because they love each other so much. And so the argument is, how can you say it's wrong to have so much love or too much love? And then the secondly, the parents, and often they do this, subconsciously with good intentions they go we don't want our kids getting involved in gangs and and in the wrong group of friends so we want home to feel like it's their gang so they're not going to be a subject to peer pressure so we're going to do everything constantly together as a family so that is what makes it difficult and so if you're listening to this and you have an enmeshed family, you, you might not even see it. And what I say, you might struggle with. But for those of you who grew up in an enmeshed family, you might look back now based on what I'm going to say and say, yes, I see now how unhealthy that was, even though it felt very healthy. So let me begin to <clears throat> go through what marks an enmeshed family, characteristics. So first of all, boundaries are not healthy. So there's a lack of emotional boundaries and physical boundaries. That means there's an over-involvement in the ch child's life. 
So the challenge in every family in a, becoming a healthy family is how much is the child an individual and how much are they part of a group? When do you allow them to be themselves and meet their own needs and stand up for themselves? And when do they put aside their needs to meet the family's needs? That's the challenge. When do you let the child struggle with problems and live with the consequences of bad decisions? And when do you give them space to fail and all of those things? Or how, when do you jump in to fix them and help them and take care of them? Those are the challenges in every family. And there's a fine line between what's healthy and going too far. And so what we're looking at is the boundaries are too far. And the, there's an over-involvement. So there's an over-involvement in the child's relationships. Wanting to be there when they're playing with their friends. Wanting to be there when they're doing different activities. Not just to support them, but just to be involved in it. And some control is there. And if they've got a problem, to rush in to fix them and help them and all of those things. That's kind of the over-involvement. Hopefully this will get more and more clear as I go along. So in an Amesh family, the child is not allowed to think about what's best for them or what they want, they're focused on or made to focus on what is best for everybody and what do they want. So the balance between the child's individuality and the group gets out of balance and the child's needs don't matter as much as the group. It's not a 50-50 where you got to give and take. It's the group matters most of all. And so then, when a child makes decisions to help with a family member, it's not because they freely want to help. It's because if they don't, they're going to be made to feel guilty. And it's a very subtle guilt that they will feel. And so as a result of that, the child then feels responsible for everybody else's happiness and well-being, as if they must make sure everybody is happy. And a child is afraid to say no because people will be upset with them, and so they avoid conflict. They're people pleasers. They give in to what the family wants, and they put down their needs and their desires they suppress them in light of the family, out, out of balance. The next one is, if you were to say, <clears throat> now let's say as an adult, your mom wants to call you every day. And you say, mom, I'm just going to call you once a week. You try to create some distance or less contact. You would be made to feel very guilty that you're not a good daughter or son. Or if you want to spend your holiday without your parents around, you might be made to feel guilty for that. Or if you decide that this is a choice, I need to move across the country to pursue this job that would take me away from family, you might be made to feel guilty for that. So making decisions that put distance between you and the family, you will get opposition. And so what you can begin to see is that the child grows up without having a strong sense of who they are. They know who the family is. They know what the family's expectations are. They know what the family's needs are. They're just not sure of their own needs. They're not sure of their own thoughts. They just know what dad thinks. They're not sure of their own emotions. They just know that they got to be happy all the time to keep everybody else happy. And so they don't know who they are. And that means they don't feel like an individual. They just feel part of a group, not an individual that can separate from that group. And so they have to think a certain way, feel a certain way, and all of that usually is they have to think like dad wants them to think, they have to feel like dad wants them to think, because you can't be an individual. And that, again, 
is not healthy. Now, I'm going to keep developing this, and hopefully it gets clearer and clearer. When it comes to the emotional world, you're not sure what your feelings and emotions are versus what the family's feelings and emotions are. Or as an adult, you're not sure what your emotions are and your partner's emotions are because you've shared emotions all the time. You pick up and absorb other people's feelings. And if somebody's not happy, you feel obligated to rush in to make them happy. And so you can't feel good if somebody else is feeling bad. You can't feel up when somebody is feeling down because of this shared emotions. And so with that then is the expectation that if somebody's feeling down, it is your responsibility to lift them up. And you get very confused. And if you don't, then you're made to feel guilt and shame and even silent treatment, emotional abuse for not doing what you should for the family, and you're told you're selfish, etc., because you didn't rush in. Okay, let me take it further. Sometimes the par- you see that your parents' self-worth hinges on your success and accomplishments. So they love it when you get a great report card or a trophy or an award because they want to tell all their friends and they don't tell it just to build you up. They tell it so that people think, wow, you're great parents. Then you find your parents want to know everything about your life. And so they're constantly pressing you for details about relationships, activities, all kinds of different things. And then sometimes you feel like your parents' life centers around the kids because the kids are the trophies that reflect on them. Many have found that their parents didn't encourage them to follow their dreams. Rather, their parents tried to get them to follow the parents' dreams for them. And that was what really mattered. And so you feel like You have to meet your parents' expectations for you, their goals for you, because if you don't, you're in trouble. And so you give up your natural goals in order to please them and pursue their goals. Sometimes enmeshed parents treat their children like friends. And they rely on them for emotional support and sometimes share information with them that's not really appropriate for a child to be hearing from mom or dad. And we call that emotional incest. And with that comes inappropriate roles. So parents becoming the child's best friend and the child feeling like they're their parent's confidant their parents' only source of emotional support. And all of that means that the child has to carry the load of what the parent is going through, keep the secrets, and be there to support the parent so that the child feels like the parent to their mom or dad. Sometimes within enmeshed families, parents will voice favoritism. That one child is their favorite. And so through that, the ch- there's a whole bunch of dynamics that take place, and you can see how damaging that can be. And so sometimes the child that is the extra support to that parent, the child that is their confidant, is treated differently, treated in a special way. Next the child then, as you can see, grows up feeling that they don't really control their life. The family controls it. And they have to surrender to the family's control of their life. And in some families, the family will really dictate pretty much every aspect of their life. Friendship, what they think about politics, religion, all kinds of different topics. The family basically says, we are going to control how you think and what you think 
about all of these. And to challenge that makes you disloyal, makes you a bad child. So you have to adapt. There's almost like a cult mentality. And so the child then grows up with an intense fear of conflict and abandonment. And one of the reasons for that is sometimes in the mesh families, the families create the loyalty by saying, we're here for there, nobody else out there is there for you, the world's a terrible place, all, all kinds of bad things. So if you're not loyal to the family, you're going to get screwed up big time. And so the child feels that to challenge the family or to abandon the family would put them into a terrible place. And so there's a great fear of abandonment. Some children, when they get to be adults, they will feel the pressure to remain in the same town as their parents, to go to a nearby college, to pursue any interests outside of the family unit. Now, let me just stop and say this. Children usually, when they're growing up in this, they don't usually realize all the subtleties of what's going on. But as they get older, they might realize, wow, there was a lot of unspoken rules that we never even analyzed or evaluated. We just accepted them, went along with them. But now if I am going to look at them and evaluate them, whoo, some of those weren't healthy. And if I start questioning some of the rules in this family, whoa, is there ever going to be a backlash? Because now I'm threatening the family. Now I'm being disloyal. Now I'm being a problem to this wonderful family. So there's all kinds of subtle pressure never to challenge the system. Because to do so makes you a very bad person. Now that then leads to the next. Let's say you go out and get married. And your person you marry comes in and they aren't afraid to challenge the system, and they go, this is sick. Now, guess what happens? The family sees the new person, your partner, as a bad guy, as the enemy, as a threat, and they're viewed as an outsider, and they're not welcomed into the family system. Sometimes when you are married and you're a parent, and you go to the family, you neglect your own children because the family still gets your loyalty. The family still is your number one priority. You can't put distance between them and focus on your children or your partner, and it can cause tons of conflict. And then if you're married and your partner and you have a conflict, and they say, I just need some space and time to process my thoughts, to cool down. That freaks you out. Because you just want to rush in and fix it and make sure everything's okay. You don't know what to do to give people space when there's some negative emotions involved. So that's, I hope, helpful for you to get a picture of an enmeshed family. It's not everybody in complex trauma that has an enmeshed family, but some do. And it's a tricky one to distinguish at times between unhealthy and healthy. Unhealthy enmeshment and healthy involvement in each other's lives and healthy boundaries. But think about some of the long-term effects of growing up in enmeshment. You will have boundary issues. You will have trouble thinking for yourself standing up for yourself. You will be made to feel some shame because you can't be yourself and you, you couldn't be yourself in your family. You were made to feel less than if you tried. And so shame was part of that. If you had an opinion that disagreed with the boss, you were made to feel stupid, which fed shame. So all of those things are long-term things and they present challenges in recovery. So people with enmeshment, once they come into recovery, they have to learn healthy boundaries, and that takes some doing. They have to learn to be okay with being alone. They have to learn to be okay with being an individual and standing up for themselves. 
they have to watch Odebo get drawn, being drawn into chaos, into everybody's problems. And they have to learn how to care for people but stay detached. All of those are super difficult for children that come out of a mesh families. So that gives you a little bit of an idea or a perspective on one way to look at unhealthy families. Next week, we're going to take it further and look at dysfunctional families. But that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll come back with the Christian part. And if that's not of interest to you, not a problem. Nobody's going to be offended by that. We'll see you next Friday. Really? Well, welcome back to the Christian part. And we've started a, a brief study on a book of the Bible called Song of Songs. And it's a love poem. And it's considered to be this hard to talk about part of the Bible because much of it is in very figurative language from that culture that is very hard to understand. Some of it is very X rated, it talks a lot about sex and describing body parts and all of that. And so what I've tried to do is to show that this is actually a beautiful book on the difference between healthy and unhealthy relationships. Because the woman in the story, she has a healthy relationship, but she was taken from that by King Solomon and put in a harem. So she's actually in two relationships. And as a result of that, she can make a contrast. So one is healthy, one is not healthy. And we've been looking at the differences. And so to, today we're coming to the topic of intimacy. And the point is, is that a healthy relationship works towards deeper and deeper intimacy in healthy ways. So we begin as a context by looking at chapter 3, verse 11, where it says this, Daughters of Jerusalem, look on King Solomon wearing a crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding. Now, if you were to read kind of the, the whole chapter and get the context, what is it, I think it is saying is this. It's emphasizing that King Solomon is legally married. And the question is, does being legally married in and of itself make a good marriage? And the answer is no. It's not being married that makes a legally married that makes a great relationship. It is intimacy that makes a great relationship. And so what it goes on to do is give us two metaphors. And again, it's very figurative language, hard to understand in a sense. But I, I think if you kind of get the point, then it just fills out beautifully. And so both metaphors are about intimacy. And so I'm going to give you the two metaphors, and then I'm going to give you four points about intimacy that I think the metaphors are making. So the first one talks about, in chapter 4, the mountains of Lebanon. It says this, 
Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Sinir, the summit of Mount Hermon, from the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of leopards. So Mount Hermon is at the northern, past the northern part of Israel into Lebanon. And it is a high, high mountain and is basically the source of water down into Israel. So when it talks about Mount Hermon or the mountains of Lebanon, what's important to understand is that they were considered distant. It took a long journey to get to them and up them or down them. And they were very dangerous. And so what I think he is saying is, we do not have intimacy naturally with people. It takes time and work. It's like going on a long journey. There's a distance that has to be tra traveled. And so to get an, to know a person takes time. It doesn't just happen because you feel in love with them. And so beyond that, it's a distance, but you got to go about it the right way. So complex trauma causes people to think there's such a thing as instant intimacy, quick intimacy. And what this is saying is, no, it is a long journey. It is something that gradually happens over a period of time. There is no such thing as instant intimacy. There might be instant feelings of intimacy, but not true intimacy intimacy. Secondly, intimacy involves danger. To get up or down Mount Hermon was dangerous. And what it's saying, I think, is this. When you open yourself up to true intimacy, you always are putting yourself in danger of being hurt. So initially, when you start to open up to a person, you think they might be safe, but you might find out they're not. That's one possibility. Or they might be safe, but as you grow in intimacy, you're going to hurt each other. Maybe not intentionally, but you're never going to have a relationship that is totally free from hurting the other person. And so intimacy opens you up to some danger. Now, the goal in what we did with the red flags is to prevent the danger to use the red flags as warning signs of certain people that would hurt you a lot. But even if you find a safe person, know that in opening up to them, there will be some times, hopefully not very often, but there will be some times when you will get hurt. You cannot have intimacy without some hurt. That is the point. Then the second metaphor is of a garden. And it says, you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. So locked up, enclosed, sealed. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes, and all the finest spices. You are a garden fountain, a well of flowering, of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. So it's a beautiful picture of lush greenery, of beautiful smells from the spices and the incense. But the thing is, it's a locked up garden. It's not open for general access. You can only access the garden if the owner lets you in, invites you in. And I think that leads to the third thing about intimacy. Intimacy can't be forced. True intimacy only happens when the other person invites you to get to know them better. It has to be freely given to be true and to be done in a healthy way. Now, they will only invite you in if they know that you respect 
their boundaries, that you respected the locked gate. And here's what I want you to understand. A person will only respect the locked gate if they respect you. They will only respect your boundaries if they respect you. If they don't respect your boundaries, that means they don't respect you. And so what it is saying is, don't let people into the garden. Don't offer intimacy to people who don't respect your boundaries, who don't respect you. That will never be healthy intimacy. Now I think again there's a contrast being made between this couple and Solomon. Because Solomon didn't respect the boundaries of the women that he brought into his harem because he didn't respect them. He thought he owned them. He thought they were this, just there to do what he wanted. Their needs didn't matter, only his. And so out of that lack of respect became sexual intimacy, but not true intimacy because people did not want to open up. And so the point then is this. True intimacy doesn't just happen because you're married. True intimacy needs an environment of respect and safety where the other person feels safe in inviting you in to get to know them better. Then the next thing I want you to understand is this. All of these metaphors are saying intimacy is not a constant. It is not an interrupted reality where you just stay at this place of deep intimacy that continues to deepen and deepen and it never gets broken. There's nothing that can mess it up. No, there are all kinds of things that can interrupt intimacy, that can break, shatter intimacy. And in many relationships, intimacy ebbs and flows. It is back and forth. There's a growth in intimacy, then it stops for a while. It is something that needs constant work. Because naturally, couples drift apart, not together. And so growing in intimacy takes constant attention and constant work. So why is intimacy not a constant? Well, it could be because one of the people in the relationship feels a little hurt. They feel rejected. They close their heart a little bit to the other person. And intimacy stops. Or they have a conflict that they can't resolve. And intimacy stops. Or there's just a series of misunderstandings that result in hurt and intimacy stops. Or in our culture today, they both just get so busy with work, with children, with responsibilities that they don't have the time or take the time and energy to invest in deepening intimacy. And then if you bring complex trauma in, they come with their own baggage. And when that baggage gets triggered... They can do more damage and they can close their heart and all kinds of things can happen that interrupt intimacy. And so the sad reality about humans is we tend to drift apart naturally. We don't naturally just drift together. That takes a lot of work. And so intimacy, it is saying, is what makes a relationship satisfying. It is not the sex. It is not just being married. It is growth in intimacy. But healthy intimacy doesn't just happen. There's lots of things that pull you from intimacy. But then you need respect. You need safety. You need to spend time working at it in order to have it. And so it ends by saying this. Awake north wind and come south wind. Blow on my garden, that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into this garden and taste its choice fruits. In other words, when a person feels loved, safe, 
respected, valued for who they are, they just say, come on in. Enjoy the fragrance of this intimate garden, of this beautiful garden. I hope you see that that kind of intimacy takes time. So you can have intimacy in the early parts of the relationship, but you still don't know each other real well. So as you continue that intimacy, what changes is you get to know each other better, which means there's a deepening of intimacy now in another way. Not just time together and talking, but you're connected by your knowledge, by sharing the same heart and the same passion. And that takes work and time. But what the writer wants us to see is, boy, is it worth it. That is what makes the relationship satisfying. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you designed us in a way that wants to connect. And we know there are just so many forces that would prevent healthy connection. But when people begin to learn how and they experience it, the joy, the fulfillment that comes from that surpasses just about every other joy. And I just long that people would experience that in their lives, in their recovery, and they would begin to know the beauty of healthy intimacy. Well, that's the end of another Friday. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to seeing you next Friday.